Three. What do you think about shapes? I love shapes. Barbecue ones. Oh, pizza ones. The topping is so good on shapes. Not the crackers, you dick. <laughs> I'm talking about object shapes. Ob object what? Yeah, I have no idea what object shapes either. But it's a Ruby 3.2 thing. Mmm, Ruby 3.2. That sounds tasty. I love me an object shape. Well, with the help of object shapes, we can increase case hits and instance variable lookups. Decrease runtime checks. Improve JIT performance. That's where object shapes come in. In the next talk, we'll learn how they work, why we implemented them for Ruby 3.2, and some interesting implementation details. Gemma Isrov works on Shopify's Ruby infrastructure team, and in 2022, she implemented object shapes in CRuby alongside Aaron Patterson. She's also co-founder of WNB.RB, a women and non-binary Ruby community, and the co-host on the Ruby on Rails podcast. Roop. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Michael, you mentioned the Ruby on Rails podcast. Do they ever talk about pairing? I'm sure she'll have us on to talk about pairing, but she told me she did a lot of pairing with Aaron Patterson whilst working on object shapes, and her favourite part of pairing is seeing everyone else's different workflows and little tools and tricks that they use. And let's just have a little speaker sponsor moment here. Gemma was brought here today by Shopify. Huge thanks to Shopify for helping out with flights, accommodation, bringing Gemma here all the way to share her knowledge with us from New York City. We have... I'm going to steal your line, Gemma Israf, implementing object shapes for CRuby. Oh, and now we're on. I hit the off button accidentally. Thank you for that intro. We would love to have you on the podcast. Let us know when. Um, so Christmas each year is usually not a big deal day for me. I don't celebrate Christmas. And so besides offices and shops being closed, it passes just like any other ordinary day. Except, as many of us in this room might know, we get a new Ruby version usually <laughs> on Christmas Day. Right? So in 2022, uh, Ruby 3.2 was released on Christmas Day. And this made Christmas actually a really special day for me. Um, it was the first time I had a, a feature in Ruby that was shipping and is now live and shipped. So I did have a, have a little something under the tree this past year, which was quite exciting. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about that, about what I worked on in 2022. Uh, as Michael and Selena just said, it's called Object Shapes. So, so we're going to talk about implementing object shapes in CRuby. I'm Gemma, I use she, her pronouns. If we haven't met yet, please come introduce yourself. I would, I would really love to meet you. Uh, like they also mentioned, I work at Shopify. I work on the Ruby infrastructure team, so this was just part of my day job. There's been a lot of talk about open source at this conference and how to do open source. This is another way to do it, right? You can do it at your workplace. I also am a co-organizer of WNB.RB, which is a virtual woman non-binary Ruby community. We're up to about 800 members. If you're a woman non-binary person and haven't heard of us, please come find me. I would love to tell you about it. Um, so we called this, I called this talk Implementing Object Shapes in CRuby, and that's the nitty gritty of what we're gonna get into. But like Michael and Selena were saying, you might not know what that is or what that means or why it's important to you. I could have also called this talk How Instance Variables Work in Ruby. And that, I think, if we've all written Ruby, we've all used instance variables and is clearly relevant to, to what we do. Um, and the hope for this talk is that it'll be accessible if you have no background in Ruby internals, uh, or it'll be accessible if you have a lot of background. I'll kind of tease some points. Um, please come find me afterwards, and I would love to go into further detail on any of those. Um, and we'll, we'll answer three main questions throughout the course of this talk. So first, we'll talk about how they worked in Ruby 3.1, what was going on with instance variables before object shapes. Then we'll talk about what are object shapes, what does this even mean, what is this technique. And lastly, we'll talk about why implement them, so why change the way that instance variables work. Okay, so our first question, how did they work? 
Um, so we're going to start with a simple example here. Nothing fancy going on. A class with an adder accessor, and in the initialize method, we set the title and the author of a post. I know I picked very creative title and author names here <laughs> for this example. Um, and if we have a new instance of post, have we ever stopped to think about what's going on behind the scenes? So how are we actually behind the scenes? What is Ruby doing with our instance variables? How is it going to store them? Right? And we know we're all, we're all programmers here. We know we can look at this and we see, hey, those are key value pairs, right? We know what to do with that. The key is the name, the value is A and B. We can just put that in a hash or a hash map or something like that. OK, so let's create an instance variable map. And the key will be the name of the instance variable. And the value will be the value of the instance variable. And then when we go through and set our instance variables, we can put them in the map. So um, the instance variable title will have the value A. The instance variable author will have the value B. And those will just go right in our map. Um, and any further instance variables will keep doing this over and over again, which is good, right? But what happens if we have a second post here? OK, so now instead of just instance variable map, we need this to have been the first post instance variable map. And we need to make room for a second post instance variable map. And it'll have, again, these same instance variable names and values. But the first problem we might notice when we look at this is we have duplicated keys. right? And if we just have two instances of this post class, that's kind of OK. But if we have hundreds or thousands or millions of instances of this post class, that's a lot of space we're taking up with these duplicated keys that we don't need to be using. So the first solution we might think of is instead of a map, what if we just have an array per each instance, right? So what if we store the values of the instance variables for one instance in an array? And then for the class itself, we'll have this map that's going to take us from instance variable names to the index in this array. So then each instance is only going to have an array instead of a map. Um, and when we do something like set title, we'll say, hey, is title known for our post class? Do we have it in our instance variable names map? No. OK, let's put it in there at the next available index, which in this case is 0. And then at the index 0 in our array, we'll put in the value. So that all we're actually storing for this first post instance variable is the value. And we'll do the same thing for author. We'll say, does it exist already in the instance variable names map? No, OK, next available index, 1. At the index 1 in our array, we'll put the value b. Um, and this is how instance variables work in Ruby 3.1. Um, there's one more caveat here. Um, is, yeah, so we have the, the keys only once, right? Instead of duplicating those keys, doing that extra work, we only have the keys appear once. The one final caveat, though, is that the hash lookup itself isn't actually cheap, right? Uh, reading instance variables is one of the most common operations we do in Ruby. And so even something like a hash lookup, we want to try optimize a little further. Um, so we cache this instance variable lookup, and we use the class as the cache key. Um, so when we set a title to be A, on this instruction itself, we're actually going to cache, hey, for the post class, the index of title is 0. And for the post class, the index of author is 1. And that works well. That's, again, how Ruby 3.1 works. If you're running Ruby 3.1, this is what you have going on. The one kind of case where it doesn't work as well as it might is something like this. Um, so what if we had our front page post class that's going to inherit from the post class? And for something like active record that we're really used to using, um, we see this, this kind of thing all the time. And then we have a new front page post. Right? Since we're cached on the class name, we're actually going to have cache misses here, which is making it uh, quite a bit slower for something like active record than it needs to be. OK. So now we've talked about how instance variables worked in Ruby 3.1. Next up, what are object shapes? So we're not actually, t I didn't really understand the barbecue references earlier. I don't know. I think it was because I was half paying attention. <laughs> Hopefully everyone else did. We're not talking about literal shapes here. None of this stuff. Um, when we say object shapes, what are we talking about? Uh, we really mean Ruby objects. So something like object new or, or a Ruby object that we're used to. 
And when we say shapes, it's like kind of in quotation marks, right? We're gonna use this term to say every object has a shape. Um, and it's a, it's a technique that's used in, in other um, VMs as well, this technique called object shapes. And the shape represents the object's properties. Um, and we'll get more into this later in the talk, but some properties encoded with the shape are like instance variables, frozen status, capacity, size pool. If you don't know what all of that means, great, we'll get into it. Um, so going back to our post class, uh, let's look at what a shape might look like for this first post. Um, so again, not a literal circle, I'm just using, <laughs> using that to symbolize a shape. Um, and it's gonna have the instance variable name. So we know for the post class, uh, for this first post, the instance variables that we have are title and author, um, so the shape will have those instance variable names in it. Uh, and the shape's also gonna have an ID, just a way to uniquely identify it. So this shape will give ID six. And if we look at another um, instance of a different class, uh, this user class with name and login, uh, this instance user will also have a shape. Its instance variables, like we just said, are name and login, and it'll have its own ID. If we shift this up to make room for another class here, um, we have a totally separate class called admin. Uh, we have an instance of admin. Admin just happens to have the same instance variables as user, right? These classes aren't related, but they, they both have names and logins. <laughs> Again, very, uh, very creative values for these names and logins. Um, but what you'll see here is that both of these shapes have the same properties. And this means they're actually the same shape. And this should be hopefully triggering something for you with what we were just talking about in Ruby 3.1. Hopefully you're seeing, seeing where we're going with this. Um, and the shape of an object transitions with new properties. So as we add new properties, instance variables, or things like that, we're gonna transition the shape. Um, so looking at that more concretely, uh, every object starts at what we call the root shape, which is basically an empty shape, right? It has ID zero, there's nothing going on in it, no IVARs. So when we call first post is post.new, we'll start at that root shape. When we set title, we'll transition through an edge with the value title to a shape whose IVARs are just title with a new ID, and we'll make that transition. When we set author to the next value, we'll make another transition through an edge um, with the name author to a new shape whose IVARs are gonna be now title and author and it'll have also its own ID. Um, and so that's, that's what that post will look like. If we had a slightly different post class where in the initialize method we only set title, then, and, and in the set author method we set the author, um, then our first po post would have this shape with ID one, but if we had a second post and on the second post we set author, that second post would have this shape with ID two. So this is another kind of critical case here, right? We could have two instances of the same class that actually are gonna have different shapes. Okay, um, one more example I wanna walk through of, of uh, transitioning through a shape is if we had this image class and this existing shape structure, um, and the image is gonna have a title and an image URL. Um, we'll start again at the root shape. We'll make that transition we've already seen through title and then because we don't ha yet have a transition for image URL, what we'll do in this case is create a new transition to a new shape whose IVARs are gonna be title and image URL, and we'll make that transition. And as you might have noticed, the shapes form a tree, right? This is a, a tree structure we have here, which is our object shapes. Okay, so we've answered two of our questions so far. The one we have left is why implement object shapes in CRuby? We've seen how instance variables used to work, we've seen what object shapes are, now why did we make this change? And we're gonna focus on three points um, when we talk about why implement object shapes in CRuby. Uh, we'll talk first about cache hits, then we'll talk about code complexity, and lastly we'll talk about how this interacts with JITs. So the first, increased cache hits. We actually, with object shapes, we're able to change how caching works on instance variable reads and writes. So if you remember when we were talking about Ruby 3.1, we were saying we were getting these cache misses in a case that looked like this, right, with class inheritance, which happens quite frequently in Ruby code. How instance variables now work in Ruby 3.2, now that we've merged object shapes, um, 
is different. Instead of this instance variable names uh, map, we no longer have that. We have instead our, our shape tree. And I fudged the details a little earlier. We don't actually store the instance variables on the shapes themselves because we store them on those edge names there. Right, we store them on the edges, we don't store them on the shapes, so we can get rid of them. What we do actually store on the shapes themselves is the instance variable index. So what index does this instance variable appear in in the array? Right, this, this index that we were talking about, which is how we're going to access our array. Um, so in this case, the, the first uh, instance variable title is at IV index, instance variable index zero. The second one, author, is at instance variable index one. And instead of using the class as the cache key, because we saw a few problems with that, we use the shape ID as the cache key. So if we look at our example like this, um, when we set title, uh, we start at the root shape, we transition through the title edge to the shape with ID one. We see, hey, the IV index is one. I mean, it's zero. At that IV index of zero, set the value A. Then uh, we cache that, so we say, hey, for shape with ID one, the index of this instance variable is zero, and we can cache that instead. And that's where we're getting, right, just again, the index is zero, and we're seeing that here. And then similarly, when we set author to the value B, we transition from this shape with ID one through the author edge to the shape with ID two at IV index one. At IV index one, we then set the value B. And we cache that, right? We say for shape two, the IV index is one. And again, that's where we're getting that information from. And then we can see in this example where we have a front page post that inherits from post, we'll actually get cache hits, right? Because it's just gonna take the exact same shape path and we're no longer dependent on the class itself. Um, so we're getting increased cache hits. You don't just have to take my word for it. I have micro benchmarks to prove it. Um, so we were focusing a lot on, on optimizing these micro benchmarks, which are within uh, CRuby. These are all different ones that are like setting and getting IVARs in the list. In this list, all of the Ruby benchmarks that have to do with setting and getting IVARs. Um, greater than one means that shapes is faster. Roughly equal to one means they're the same speed, and less than one means Ruby 3.1 is faster. This within 2% on micro benchmarks is kind of hard to reproduce and easily within a margin of error. We can see we have three benchmarks where shapes is clearly faster and two benchmarks where shapes is significantly faster. And the one I just wanted to briefly talk about was this VM IVAR init subclass benchmark. Um, this is the code for the benchmark. You can go look at it on Ruby itself. Um, and what it's doing, what happens in a loop over and over again, is B set IVARs, C set IVARs, B set IVARs, C set IVARs. And if you look at what B and C are, it's actually this case we were just talking about, right? Where B and C both inherit from the same class, but they're themselves different classes. So we can see they would make the exact same shape transitions, and in Ruby 3.1, they would have been getting cache misses, where in Ruby 3.2, they'll now get cache hits. Um, so yeah, it was exactly this case uh, where we had cache misses and we now have cache, mi cache hits. Um, and obviously op optimizing these micro benchmarks is good. Um, we're just starting to see Ruby 3.2 in the wild. Thank you everyone who's already upgraded and we're seeing uh, performance benefits there. Um, hopefully uh, speeding up your IVAR gets and sets along with many other changes that, that uh, have come in Ruby 3.2 will make Ruby 3.2 significantly better for you than Ruby 3.1. Another big reason to implement object shapes in CRuby is to decrease code complexity. So, and this is code within CRuby itself. Um, and we did that in two ways that I wanna talk through. So we're gonna get a little into the internals in a way that's hopefully accessible. The first is reducing frozen checks in IVAR sets. What do I mean by that? We said we had a few different properties encoded within the shape, and the second one of those that I want to talk about is the frozen status. So if we go back to our shape tree, if we had this anonymous post, so named because it has a title but no author, um, and we called anonymous post.new, we know we would start at the root shape, we would transition 
through the title edge to shape with ID one. And then what if we froze this anonymous post? What would happen? Um, we would actually make a new transition through a frozen edge uh, to a shape with ID four with the same instance variables, right? The same one as the parent shape, but it's now gonna be a frozen shape. Um, and what does this do for us? Why, why are we um, including frozen in here? It's actually gonna um, speed up our fast path on instance variable sets. And so in order to understand that, I wrote some pseudocode for how set instance variable works. So it's written in C, but this is a Ruby pseudocode for, for at, a, at a high level what's happening when we set instance variables. We can look first at our arguments. We have the object we're gonna set the instance variable on, which makes sense. We have our cache, which is what we were just talking through. We have the instance variable name, which instance variable do we wanna set? And we have the instance variable value. And the first thing we did pre-object shapes in Ruby 3.1 is we said, hey, check if the object is frozen, right? Because we know an object being frozen is, means by definition that we can't set instance variables on it. Then we did this cache comparison, right? Where we're saying, hey, if the index is already cached, we don't need to do anything here. But if the index, if the class isn't cached, sorry, I meant class, if the class isn't cached, we need to do our expensive computation to find the index, right? And that's the thing where we were saying earlier here, this wasn't a cheap operation. And then once we've done our expensive computation, our final thing to do in setting an instance variable is to actually set it, right? Actually put the value where it should go. And so this is how it worked pre-object shapes in Ruby 3.1. In Ruby 3.2 with object shapes, it works a little differently. The first thing we discussed is we're no longer comparing classes here, right? We've no longer cached classes, we've cached shape ID. So we're gonna compare shape IDs. Um, and our expensive computation, what it looks like is climbing up the shape tree looking for the instance variable. So if we had our shape tree and say we started at shape with ID three and we were looking for the index of title, we would go up, we would say, hey, image URL is not title, not that shape, not what we're looking for. Go up one shape to the parent. Hey, title is title, that's what we're looking for. Great, we can pull our IV index right off of there. And that's that slow path. But why are we talking about this, right? I mentioned frozen, what does that have to do with this? Well, we know the frozen status is encoded within the shape as well, right? Which means we only need to actually check the frozen status on the slow path. Because if it's been cached, meaning we've already set an instance variable, then we know we can set an instance variable because we know the shape wasn't frozen and so wasn't frozen the last time we set it and so the same shape is not frozen. Um, so to look at that more concretely, the shape is cached if we were at this shape, which means we've already transitioned from this shape. So the shape by definition cannot be frozen, which means there's no need for the frozen check. So we only actually need to check this frozen status on the slow path, which means that with object shapes, we've made the fast path faster, right? The fast path is now just doing the set. It doesn't have to do this frozen check anymore. Okay. The second way we've decreased code complexity is we've removed undef sets in object allocations. And in order to understand this, we need to understand a little more what's happening when we call object.new. So we know if we run code like this, we'll get back a Ruby object, right? Or any sort of class.new will get back a Ruby object. But under the hood, what's actually going on? Ruby is giving us our object, and it's giving us a certain number of instance variables for that object. Um, in Ruby 3.1, in most cases, it was three. Um, and then we can do something like call instance variable set on that object, right? We can say, hey, let's set this instance variable A to a value, let's say nil. And then Ruby behind the scenes is gonna say, okay, we'll put in nil where you want it, great. And then we know we can call obj.instance variables, right? We can say, hey Ruby, give me whatever instance variables you have back. And it's just gonna give me A. A was nil, right? How did it know to just give me what's at that zeroth index and not some other garbage or nonsense at the other indices? How did it know to do this? 
It was because Ruby had already filled those in with undef values, what we internally call qundef or undef values. And undef and nil are separate things. Um, so that's why we're only getting back a, because it's looking for hey, in Ruby 3.1, it was looking for hey, which values are not undef here. And so what's really going on when you call object.new in Ruby 3.1 is Ruby's going through and saying, I'm going to give you all these instance variables. Not only am I going to give them to you, I'm going to fill them in with undef right away. And doing that, filling them in with undef, actually has a bit of a performance cost and clearly a complexity cost, right? I just had to explain this whole thing of what was going on behind the scenes. What changes with object shapes? Well, we know that to get the index, we just traverse up the tree, right? And if we're looking for an instance variable and it's not there, it just won't be in the path up the tree. And in order to get all the instance variables we have, all we need to do is traverse the tree. So that means when you're calling object.new, we no longer need to do these undef sets at all, um, which speeds up object allocations a bit. And we no longer have the performance or the complexity cost associated with filling in these undefs. Okay, the last reason I want to talk about this, uh, why we implemented object shapes in C Ruby, is because it's beneficial for just in time compilers. Um, other team members of mine at Shopify, led by Maxime, have been working on YJIT, uh, which is new just in time compiler you should definitely check out if you haven't yet. Um, in order to understand how it's beneficial for just-in-time compilers, we need to look at the last two properties that I wanted to talk about encoded within the shape. And those are the capacity and the size pool of the object. So in order to understand capacity, we want to go into what it means for an object to be embedded versus extended. As some of us might know, when we start a Ruby program, we're given a Ruby heap, which is our kind of space of memory that we can work with within Ruby. There's also an OS heap, uh, the operating system heap, from which actually the Ruby heap is given to us, but which we can also use for some overflow or some extra memory. So behind the scenes, when you, uh, when you ask Ruby for a new object, it's going to carve out some space for that object in the Ruby heap. And within that object, like we've discussed, it's going to carve out some space for some instance variables. And in Ruby 3.1, most of the time, this was three instance variables. Right? You would start with three instance variables. And an object that looks like this is called an embedded object, where it has three or fewer instance variables. But you might be saying, well, I've, I've written a lot of Ruby that has more than three instance variables on an object. Right? What's going on there? What if the instance variables have more space than we've been given for the object? Then Ruby will move them over to the OS heap for you. And from the object, we'll have a pointer to like, hey, this is where the instance variables are located. And this type of object is called an extended object. And as you might imagine, accessing these instance variables is a little more costly than in an embedded object because we have to follow the pointer and go out to the OS heap. And so in Ruby 3.1, this was uh, for whenever we had more than three instance variables. So the capacity is on an object shape is saying, hey, how many instance variables are allowed on this object shape, on this object the way it is? Is it three? Is it more than three? And if more than three, what's that number? The last property we care about is size pool. Um, some other teammates of mine, Peter Zhu and Matt Valentine House, have been working on variable width allocation, which also shipped from Ruby 3.2. And it actually changes the model of what we just talked about a little. So I'm going to grow out the Ruby heap just for more slide space here. They said, hey, instead of this one single fixed size object, we're going to have five or six different fixed sizes that objects can be and still be embedded. Um, and each one of these fixed sizes can store varying amounts of instance variables in embedded objects. And then these objects are going to be within groups of all the same size. And that group will be a size pool. Um, so we also encode within the shape what the size pool of the object is. So we have now instance variables. If it's frozen, we make a transition. If it changes capacity, we make a transition. And when it first gets its size pool, we make a transition. I said this was beneficial for JITs. Why? Well, just-in-time compilers really care about where values are. 
And with all of this information about whether instance variables are, whether an object is embedded or extended and what its size pool is, we can guarantee a JIT that the instance variables will be in exactly the same space they were for another object. Whereas if two objects have different capacities, right, they could have different places that these instance variables actually exist. Um, so I was talking about YJIT earlier. I want to briefly show some YJIT generated assembly for instance variable get. I don't want you at all to pay attention to the code itself. If you're curious about it, please ask me afterwards. I want you to pay more attention to the lengths, because um, in this case they actually are relevant. Uh, before object shapes, this is what an instance variable get looked like in YJIT machine code. After object shapes, this is what it looks like. The big takeaway here is that after object shapes, there are fewer instructions, fewer comparisons, and importantly, fewer memory reads. Um, so if we look at a benchmarked instance variable get, for instance, for example, sorry, <laughs> um, we can see that if we do before and after object shapes with YJIT, there was a 45% speed up with object shapes on instance variable gets in YJIT. Before object shapes, YJIT was already 3.76 uh, times faster than the interpreter on an instance variable get. With object shapes, it's now 5.42 times faster than interpreter um, on an instance variable get, which is quite a significant speed up. Uh, so the three main questions we answered here are how instance variables used to work, how they now work in Ruby 3.2, and, and how they do so with object shapes. And I've given a few versions of this talk at different points in the work, and I usually get two questions afterwards, so I'm going to try, try answer those preemptively. The first question I get is some version of should I change this code, and someone will show me a snippet that boils down to something like this. Class confusing. Initialize takes a bool. If the boolean is true, they'll assign a first variable and then a second variable. If the boolean is false, they'll assign a second variable and then a first variable. And they'll say, hey, I was thinking about it with your talk, with what you were explaining. I think the shape tree is going to look like this. And I think that won't be quite so good for caching, right? Because we're going to split the first variable and the second variable. And I think it would be better for caching if the shape tree could look like this. So they'll say, should I change this code? Should I change it to something like this class not confusing, where I assign the variables in the same order so that it works better with object shapes? And to that, I respond, no. You shouldn't change it so that it works better with object shapes. <laughs> It will work better with object shapes, but it will also be easier for all of your teammates to work with and read and maintain and all of those other things. And that's the reason you should change it, right? That we can see this code on the right is, is much easier to understand and reason with than the code on the left. Um, and so no, you, you shouldn't have to do anything, make any changes for object shapes, right? Some of you hopefully have already been using 3.2 and maybe even without your knowledge have been using object shapes. Um, but if your code is confusing, you should definitely change it to make it better for other users of your code to, to, to work with. The second question I get is how can I see object shapes in my program? People will say, oh, I'm so curious about this in the tree. Is there a way I can actually see this info if I'm playing with it locally or something like that or just on my machine in a test file? The answer is yes. Um, we made a little small API. Uh, some folks might be familiar with objectspace.dumpall, which is going to give you all your objects. We made an objectspace.dumpshapes, which is going to point you to a file um, with a JSON representation of all of your object shapes. And you can go look at them here. They'll look something like this. There will be many, many more of them. And you can have some fun with the JSON and construct the tree and make cooler visualizations than I am capable of making of your shape tree. Um, so these are, yeah, the three questions we, we answered today. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for, for inviting me to speak here and for having me. Thank you.